We at it again tonight. Tonight, Latasha, Shereen Williams, um, York County Assistant District Attorney, also running for the Dolphin County Common Pleas Court Judge Candidacy. And tonight she has some special guests, people that she actually helped in some serious situations. Um, it's the Fireside Chat with, guess who? Latasha Shereen Williams. So Latasha, tonight we got uh, Jeff is on on board first. Um, you might want to tell everybody who you know some dialogue of yourself first, and then jump right into Jeff, and let's go on this journey. Right. I don't. I don't. I don't see anything on the Facebook page. Just to 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 do the share. You will. Don't okay. worry. It's going okay. to show up. I yeah, you know. might need to just refresh your screen, Jeff. So, like, pull it down, yank it down to refresh it, no, and then you'll see yeah, it there. Just, just do the interview, and trust me, gotcha. it's going to pop up. <laughs> all right. So, first of all, thank you guys again for having me. It's always a pleasure being on your show. And, you know, I just want to give a quick shout out to SL Digital Media Podcast, which is a, a duo of Scarfo and Fred Harrison. Um, you guys, you know, do such a wonderful job of informing the community and just keeping us all connected. Uh, we learn about each other, what's going on from day to day, all throughout Pennsylvania and other places that you guys cover. So big shout out to you guys for doing what you do. We appreciate it. And um, your the message um, that we bring on the show is spread far and wide. So I'm happy to be here again. As, as you said, I am Latasha Williams. I am currently an assistant district attorney in York County, Pennsylvania. However, I live in Dauphin County, Pennsylvania. I have lived in Dauphin County, Pennsylvania for the past 13 years. A wonderful community. I've lived in the city of Harrisburg and I've also lived, I'm on the outskirts in Swatera Township, Susquehanna Township, and I'm currently a resident of Susquehanna Township. And so I'm running for a judgeship on our Court of Common Pleas here in Dauphin County in a historic election. The election is actually two weeks from tomorrow, so that's very exciting. It's down to the wire at this point. In fact, I just came in from the pouring rain, um, just out with voters, knocking on doors, uh, getting the message out about who I am and what my platform, um, if you want to call it a platform, but what my platform is about and what I uh, will bring to the bench if I am so lucky to be elected. Um, to the bench to be of service to you guys. And one of the things that I have uh, talked about and that I'm very proud of is the work I've done in the areas of wrongful conviction. Uh, in the broadcast studio right now with us is Jeff Deskovic. I am proud to call Jeff a friend. Um, we have a very interesting story in terms of how we met um, but Jeff has a very interesting story. And um, I'm going to now just turn over to Jeff so that he can share with our viewing audience his story. And then I'll talk about how we met and we'll be joined by other guests throughout tonight's um, broadcast. But without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff. Hi, thanks, Natasha. <laughs> Yeah, so my name is Jeff Deskovic, and I was exonerated after 16 years in prison uh, through DNA. I was 16 when I was arrested for a murder and rape, which I did not commit. I was wrongfully convicted despite a pretrial negative DNA test result. The conviction was caused by a coerced false confession, prosecutorial misconduct, fraud by the medical examiner, a terrible public defender. Uh, I was given a 15 to life sentence. I did six, I did 16 years. I lost seven appeals. I got turned down for parole. And ultimately I was exonerated through further DNA testing, which not only affirmed my innocence, but identified the actual perpetrator, uh, who, who would kill the second victim three and a half years later. So my charges were dismissed on actual innocence grounds and I'm now an advocate and I am an attorney. Yeah, my, my life mission is to fight to free other wrongfully convicted people and work for policy changes aimed at preventing those injustices from happening in the first place. Awesome. And where was your conviction, Jeff? That was in, uh, that was in New York, in Westchester County. Great. And so um, that's a, a very short version of Jeff's story. And when you came out of prison and were exonerated, 
Uh, what did you do to help other people that you found in a similar situation? Sure. So after after about five years, uh, I was finally financially compensated, which, you know, that's an issue in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania being one of 15 states that does not currently offer compensation. But New York did. And uh, after being an individual advocate for about five years, I was financially compensated. And I used some of the money to start the Jeffrey Deskovic Foundation for Justice, whose purpose is to free other wrongfully convicted people. And again, to push the policy changes. So we've been able to free 10 wrongfully convicted people and help pass seven laws, uh, including one in Pennsylvania, uh, automatic expungement. So we had the unique situation where people were being exonerated in Pennsylvania and yet their records weren't cleared. So when they went for job interviews uh, and apartments in similar situations, they would have uh, records. So we got that uh, change will be automatic. But it was my work at the foundation that actually brought me in contact with you uh, for the first time. Yes. So I'm trying to remember, Jeff, the first time we met, did we meet before Lorenzo was, released the first time, which we'll tell the viewing audience all about that craziness, or was it when we took him back? It's been, I've, I've known you for a while now, so I can't remember exactly when we met. Yeah, I'm, I think, I, I think that it was, I think that it was after, I think that it was after, because prior to that, I hadn't met Lorenzo. We had just corresponded a little bit lightly, but that was, uh, you know, we hadn't really developed a uh, friendship yet at that point. So I think it would have been it would that would have been the first time we met in person yes we had to yeah but just for some context i mean you know the details will come when lorenzo comes out but just for now just for the audience has some context uh suffice mm -hmm. it to say that uh lorenzo johnson was a new yorker who was wrongfully convicted in the state of pennsylvania so you had that unique twist there and his conviction was overturned after 16 and a half years based on legally insufficient evidence and you know, Lorenzo and I had briefly corresponded a little bit while he was still in. And when he came home, the foundation uh, helped him to uh, reintegrate. And uh, the, Pennsylvania, the then Pennsylvania Attorney General appealed the reversal to the U.S. Supreme Court, which reinstated his conviction. And ultimately, I had to drive him back to prison to resume a life without parole sentence. And we connected with you in uh, one of the cities or towns that was right near that prison. And we had this really somber last lunch type of thing. Yeah. Thank you for providing that context to the viewers. And when Lorenzo joins us, he will uh, give more detail and depth about his story. Uh, but just so the audience knows, Lorenzo Johnson's case is out of Dauphin County, the city of Harrisburg. Uh, Lorenzo and his uh, co-defendant, Corey Walker, had been accused of a murder that they did not commit. And uh, Lorenzo was finally uh, freed from prison in July of 2017. Corey Walker was freed just two years later. Uh, but they will talk a bit more about that in just a bit. And I wanted to ask you, uh, Jeff, what, um, as if I have to ask, but what inspired you to become an attorney? Sure. Well, I got tired of I got tired of sitting in the front row with a courtroom that wasn't enough for me anymore. I wanted to be able to sit at the table, represent some of the clients, myself, make some of the arguments, you know. So hence going to law school and becoming an, an, an attorney. Uh, but you know, the founder when Lorenzo was brought back, there became like a five-way collaborative effort at trying to help him regain his freedom. And that's where I did a lot of work with you. You know, the foundation um, helped a little bit on the investigative side, but primarily, you know, our role was just the public relational aspect, you know, when, and, and also the grass, the grassroots. And sometimes the foundation would rent buses and we would get bus, bus loads of New Yorkers over to Pennsylvania to hold rallies outside of the uh, then Pennsylvania attorney general's uh, office and hand delivering thousands and thousands of signatures. And, you know, we handled the bus side of it, you know, the PR side of it, you know, because a lot of Lorenzo's family and, and supporters were from New York, hence providing the transportation. But you were the on the ground coordinator, you know, of everything that happened on the ground over there. So once that bus pulled up and we put the podium down, you know, I always felt in great hands. I'm like, all right, Latasha's got it from here, you know, and from 
coordinating that to being like kind of like the uh, MC of that event and speaking to the press and you know deciding what the order of speakers was and everything. I mean that was all that was all you. You did you did a lot of work, you know, which is one of the which, which is one of the reasons why I'm really a strong supporter, you know, of your candidacy as a judge because uh, if somebody has that type of work in their background then you already know that they're well aware of injustices heading into that position so that's much more likely that such a person is going to be fair and is really going to apply the law and and the facts rather than just being a rubber stamp for uh the, the government or the prosecution But speaking of law school, one other thing I want to mention is that, you know, there was a time period, albeit in different states, that, you know, we were in, you know, regular communication, that even while you were a law student finishing up your studies to become a lawyer, you nonetheless found time to help uh, help me study because uh, I was in law school at the same time. And there were certain subjects that were that were difficult for me. And, and you helped me with that. And you spent time when I was going over you know, materials prepping for tests. And I just think the fact that you did that while you were in the same fight that I was trying to get through law school really speaks a lot to your character. Thank you, Jeff. And, um, you know, it seems like that was ages ago. Yeah, right. But we were in the trenches together. And, um, and, you know, I've always been the type of person to do whatever I could do to help someone. And I, I, you know, I knew your story. I knew your passion. Um, so anything that I could have done to help, I, I did. And so uh, it was truly my pleasure uh, and look at where we are now. So it's just so amazing, um, you know, just how far we both have come. Um, and I'm so glad to know you. And of course, Thanks, yeah. I was so I'll mention one more thing, you know, just, you know, the fight for Lorenzo, which was something you were knee deep involved in, you know, that that went on for five years, just so everybody understands. OK, it, it, you know, you were involved in that work for five years. OK, so there's not no flash in the pan one time thing. It doesn't you know, work that way. And then later on, after Lorenzo was freed. Uh, you know, we decided uh, the foundation and our coalition group, uh, it could happen to you. We wanted to do policy work in Pennsylvania. And I remember we had that initial meeting. You know, we had this big event in New York, in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. you know, our Servants of Justice banquet. And we had arranged for there to be a meeting an hour before that event, just the Pennsylvanians. We were just talking about forming that coalition group. And, you know, I just gathered together the different advocates and people in that I knew spread through Pennsylvania, but who didn't necessarily know each other. And you attended that. I remember you attended, you attended that meeting and, you know, you were, you were part of that group once again, contributing, you know, whatever you could, you know, your, your, your time and, you know, your strategy and your connectivity. So solid, solid background and solid body of work. You know, it's one thing to talk to talk in the middle of a campaign. It's something else if somebody has a big body of work that they accomplished long before they even had that aspiration. And this work mm -hmm. of yours was uh, long before you were in law school, long before you were in law school. So I want to make that argument for you. Thank you. That's very true. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, and I see that Lorenzo is back. We are uh, now joined by Giovanni Reed and Lorenzo Johnson. And so I think this is a perfect opportunity to dovetail over to Lorenzo Johnson since Jeff and I sort of got the conversation started and then we'll hear G's story. But Lorenzo, of course, I call you Kat. Um, but Kat, you know, Jeff and I started off the discussion with how we met and he first talked about his story and how he had been wrongly convicted and later exonerated in the state of New York and that our paths crossed in our effort to help free you when you were reincarcerated after the Supreme Court yes. issued a crazy decision which invalidated a lower federal court's ruling that there had been insufficient evidence to convict you of the first degree murder in the first place. So if you would just go ahead and start with the first part of your story, talk about that crazy appellate history, and then talk about the end. Uh, well, um, crazy story. 
Uh, as we know, the United States Supreme Court only listens to what one percent of criminal cases. It was a, a question of law, and for them to hear my case in 148 days was was kind of crazy and mind boggling because we appealed for years and you know we hope just to be heard. But the regular procedures is and once they accept the cases, all your arguments and stuff like that. I wasn't granted that my case was reinstated. My my sentence was reinstated with per current decision all in one day, ordering me to return to a natural life sentence. So uh now let's back up for the viewing audience. When and where did your case happen and what were you accused of? Oh, my case happened in Harris, Pennsylvania. I was accused of uh being a lookout, first degree murder. I was sentenced to uh natural life in five to ten. And uh I did a lot of fighting from there. Like when I came to prison, I was pretty much illiterate to the law, illiterate education. So I got my uh, GED, got a couple college credits, started teaching myself the law. And then I ended up representing myself for six years. And at the same time, with me, me representing myself for six years, I was reaching out to help to innocent projects from the East Coast, West Coast, down south, out of the country. I sent over 500 to 600 letters out to various organizations, to people for uh, assistance. And, uh, I got up to the Third Circuit Court of Appeals and uh, I had filed my own appeal. And by that time, Michael Wiseman and uh, Capitol Habeas uh, Unit came uh, to my aid and, and represented me. But all they did was sign off on what I already filed. And it just so happens that was insufficient evidence. And the Third Circuit Court of Appeals granted it in 2011. They granted my appeal saying the evidence was insufficient. So. Uh, the attorney general had one one appeal left that was to the United States uh, Supreme Court. And uh, at that time, the judge released me until the outcome of that because, you know, insufficient evidence that bars the retrial. So it was going to be no retrial. It was either going to be the United States Supreme Court reinstate the conviction or, you know, it's over with. Now, when and, that happened, how much time had you served in prison when the federal court said that your um, conviction was invalid because there was insufficient evidence. All right, that time was 16 and a half years. Okay, so you had already served 16 and a half, and a half years, and then the federal court said, hey, wait a minute, there was never sufficient evidence to convict you in the first place. And so then at that point, you were released conditionally? Yeah, I was released and I came back to my family, you know, got integrated, you know. I, I met up with Jeff, who I was already in touch with, but wasn't physically in contact with. And uh, Jeff showed me the ropes on, you know, speaking on wrongful convictions and getting involved in the movement, you know. He helped me with reentry. I mean, he just opened the doors to me and, you know, whatever needed to be done, he had my back. And, uh, we started doing a lot of things together. Like, you know, I was learning hands on with him and, you know, Jeff got a million things going on, as you know, and, uh, <laughs> because I used to, he used to write, he used to write in a newspaper and I used to take his articles when they sent them to me, his foundation. I used to pass it out to other innocent people in the prison and, uh, make copies for people so they could see what's going on here, here, what he got to say and get everybody involved with the innocent movement. So when I came home, it was like, so when we met up, it was off to the races. And uh, unfortunately, you know, that decision came down, but uh, Jeff did a lot. You know, there's not much you could do when the United States Supreme Court make a decision, but we was in Albany, New York, in front of a lot of people, and Jeff, like, basically sacrificed himself for my story to be heard. So let me ask you and this. That when, that, so when that decision came down and the United States Supreme Court reversed the lower court's ruling, what did that mean for you in terms of your conviction and the life sentence you had previously been serving? I didn't hear what you said. It was, it was going in and out. I'm sorry. So when the United States Supreme Court reversed the lower court's ruling, what did that mean for you in terms of your conviction, your previous life sentence? What happened at that point? If I'm right, you said what it meant by the decision? Yes. What happened after that? Oh, pretty much, you know, I had to go back to uh, prison. I was innocent, so I wasn't doing no running. I had a nice support system around me. 
And at that time, uh, I had the, De the Jeffrey Desiris Foundation representing me. I had Michael Wiseman representing me in the Capitol Habeas Unit. So uh, I felt good at my chances, but who wants to go back to prison for a crime they didn't commit and they already served 16 and a half years? And this is a natural life sentence here, whereas, you know, when they ask you where you want your body sent, you know, there's no parole. Only a judge can get you out. And the highest court in the land telling you that you got to go back and serve a natural life sentence is like swallowed, you know? So what you're saying is that you had served 16 years in prison for a crime you didn't commit, was released for five months, and then had to return back to prison to resume serving a life sentence? No, I was released for 149 days. <laughs> it was 149 days. Right. And, um, Got the message when I was at work, and I really couldn't tell what was going on because, you know, my lawyer was crying on the phone. I couldn't really hear it out. But what I did hear him say was, your conviction was reinstated. You got to, you know, they want you to go back to prison. And in the back of my head, I, you know, I'm like, you're crazy, but my body get numb when you hear something because that's like an innocent person who was released. That's their worst nightmare going back. That's their worst nightmare. And uh, I pretty much had to live that. And, uh, I went from work to the, the Desperate Foundation, and we all talked. You know, the lawyers started calling, you know, Pennsylvania to see what could be done, whatever. None could be done because it was the United States Supreme Court's not higher than them. So the plan was to solidify a, 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 a avenue that hopefully, you know, that I could get right back out, but that didn't pan out. So Jeffy, Desperate, and yourself drove me back when I voluntarily turned myself in. And, uh, that was a crazy situation and I had to wait five years for, you know, other evidence to be turned over my innocence that was in the hands of the attorney general's office all this time. Now, I remember that day, like the back of my hands, um, you and Jeff, y'all got together in New York because I don't think we told the viewing audience that you are from Yonkers, New York, um, but you, your case happened here in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And so you and Jeff got together, um, got in his car, hit the highway, came down to Pennsylvania so that you could surrender um, to the Department of Corrections here in Pennsylvania. But before doing that, I remember uh, we met up. I think y'all came to my apartment, picked me up, um, yeah. we went up on the hill. We took pictures of the crime scene. We, you know, because we, you know, knew that some work still needed to be done to further prove your innocence. And then after that, we um, had a meal at Crawdaddy's restaurant um, in Harrisburg. And at that time, Crawdaddy's was on Riley Street. So I remember that like it was yesterday. And then um, I followed you guys in my car and we headed over to SCI Camp Hill Prison. And I remember yeah. when we pulled up onto the prison grounds, the receiving correctional officer um, well, you know, we had our words at, at the car with you. And then as we walked over together to the door outside of SCI Camp Hill, the correctional officer looked perplexed. And he said, I don't know if you remember this, his exact words were, Johnson, what are you doing here? And um, and you explain like, yo, like the courts did like some crazy stuff. And, um, you know, it was a very emotional moment for me, the moment that, and then he said, and I, you know, really admire the humanity that he expressed in that moment because you put your hands together to be cuffed. And he said, I'm not going to cuff you to the back. I'll just do it to the front. And then my knees buckled from underneath me. And now, and then Jeff embraced me. Like it was, that is a day I will never forget. But, um, Look at where you are today. So how are you here today talking to the viewers? I mean, it's, it's, I mean I'm, I'm, I'm not bitter and mad. I'm disappointed in the criminal justice system of what I had to go through and uh, how, you know, for years my legal team honored, you know, the police and the prosecution and to find out that, you know, they knew I was innocent from day one and they withheld evidence for 18 and a half years to turn over, you know, and the relevance of what I'm saying is that they let false testimony go from the plenary hearing all the way to the United States Supreme Court and never corrected it. And then it turned out to in 18 and a half years later, 
they turned over the missing pages of my discovery and uh, the whole case was a lie. And instead of owning up to it, they still, you know, had me go through a, a, a how can I say, a no contest plea just to reunite with my family because of the circumstances my family was in at the time that I had to get to them. What's a no contest plea? Say it again. What is a no contest plea? Can't hear you. <laughs> I'll explain. So um, Lorenzo indicated that even though we had amassed a lot of evidence, we uncovered the fact that there were uh, statements and exculpatory evidence, which is evidence that shows someone's innocence um, that had not been turned over to his defense team uh, years ago at the time of his trial. Um, he was offered the opportunity to plead no contest, which simply means that he does not contest the charges. And um, he did that for the best interest of himself and his family, um, because as you're in prison and you guys can explain, like, you know, time moves very quickly out here and, you know, our loved ones, things, time just moves on. Um, our families get older. And so he did the no contest plea so that he could get out of prison. So salute to you for being able to make that decision, knowing that you are factually innocent, but doing what you felt that you had to do just to get out of prison and resume living your life. So thank you for sharing that part of um, your story. And um, how, so how did we meet? So good with the last part. How do we meet? How do you know me? Because <laughs> it's not that I can't hear what you're saying. So how okay. do you, oh. <laughs> he got right. on. He well, got on. Um, yeah, you hear it? I, I met Latasha Williams as far as she's like an angel to me, you know, and uh, know that. Uh, I met her through advocacy, elevated advocacy was a, uh, a service that. He was doing inside the prisons and uh was helping people with Facebook and my spaces and investigation work and and third party reaching out to people trying to help people with their cases basically and uh I reached out on I think it was a Facebook page a Facebook page of my and you was running that for me. You know, you I'll finish his thought. So basically what he was saying was that we met while he was in prison the first time and um, he reached out to me because he had heard about uh, different ways I was trying to help people in situations um, like his. And so I would help people with trying to locate witnesses to get their stories out there, um, helping them with getting exposure. And so I had created social media pages for him um, to just drum up support from the community and to get his story out there so that people would become aware of the incidents of wrongful convictions and to help put pressure on people who can make a difference, whether it's the courts, um, whether it was the attorney general's office, um, AG Kathleen King at the time, uh, you know, we were out there, we were doing the rallies, like Jeff said, um, right down on Strawberry Square in downtown Harrisburg. So that's how we met. Um, and now the story kind of all comes full circle um, because it all started with uh, my advocacy for Giovanni Reed. And so, G, uh, welcome. Um, so if you would share your story with the viewers and talk a little bit about your case and how we met, and we'll just kind of take it from there. Well, uh, well thank you. Uh, well, essentially, like, um, you know, I was, I was 16 years old and I was accused of participating in robbery and murder that happened in South Philly. Philly. Philadelphia when I was, uh, and back in 1991, um, although I was present, I, I had nothing to do with the actual crime. Um, I was with a few people that I knew from my neighborhood, and uh, one of the guys who I was with decided that, it, you know, the rob he wanted to rob and, and shoot somebody while I was present, um, and uh, ultimately, uh, I got accused of it, and uh, I went to prison at, at 16, and um you know, uh, initially, uh, my family and a lot of people that would support me at the time um, thought that uh, the truth would just come out because we were all new to the system. 
we um that was my first time ever being in a situation like that. So uh, when I got convicted, I wound up getting convicted of a uh, second degree murder, um, and I was sentenced to an automatic life sentence. Uh, even though that was my first time ever in trouble, uh, and I had no criminal background. Uh, you know, it didn't matter. Like when you get convicted of certain uh, elements of murder, is 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 an automatic thing. First and second degree is that's how it was. You know, that's how it still is. Uh, so. Um, not long after my conviction, you know, uh, I began, uh, you know, studying the law. I've been, uh, you know, trying to uh, equip myself with a, a little bit of information so I could help myself along the way. Uh, I didn't see how it would be realistic for me to expect other people to play a bigger role in help, helping me get my life back than I was playing for myself. So I always try to uh, be the fore, forefront runner in that in that regard. I try to always be the person that's always leading the charge because at the end of the day, I was the one that was locking in the cell and things of this nature. So I felt like it was it was my obligation to um, to put forth a greater effort. Can you hear me? Oh, they hear you. They definitely hear you. <laughs> okay, so everybody, yeah, everybody. Okay, so you keep uh, going. You know, it, okay, it was many, it was many years. Um, you know, I think I was into my like my tenth year of um, litigation, and I was I was always in court. Uh, I did my best to stay in court, um, you know, arguing for my innocence and stuff like like that. And then um, one day. Uh, I seen a, a, a flyer that was uh, showcasing a very innovative class coming out of Temple. And I had the opportunity to meet Tasha um, back in, I believe it was 2002. She was really young. I think she was about 19 years old in her senior year of uh, college. And I got a chance to meet her. If, if my memory serves me correct, I ultimately found out that uh, my attorney at the time was one of her law professors. Uh, Daniel Silverman, and uh, we was able to strike up some conversation as a result of that. But I was in court already, and um, I remember uh, Tasha attending one of my federal hearings, and uh, we was able to establish a lot of good evidence on record towards my innocence. And despite that, I was ultimately denied. And um, I think one of the the biggest the biggest things I felt at that time was that. You know, and everybody always thought I was coming home through these these, these various court hearings I was able to get. Um, and then I remember, you know, sitting back after I got the decision from the Third Circuit, agreeing with the district court. Uh, and I remember having to saying, like, damn, you know, I'm 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 going to lose a lot because of this. And I, I thought I was going to lose Tasha as a friend. Uh, and this was, like, again, very early on. And, um, um and surprisingly to me, um, she 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 didn't she didn't just abandon me. In fact, what she said was, "Listen, no, no, we're going we're going to fight this. We're, we're going to get in there. We're going we're going to try to develop something in your case." And um, with the help of her mom, uh, Miss Charlotte Williams, they began writing a lot about my story, uh, putting a lot of stuff on the internet, creating pages, just doing a whole lot, and. Um, I was able to um, attract the attention of a new witness who was who was actually the um, the victim's roommate who came forward uh, and said that uh, he witnessed the crime and that uh, he only witnessed one person taking a part of it and that everybody else he saw was up the street, uh, which was very supportive um, of my position uh, that I always held. So we was really excited about that. And... Um, you know, was all eager to get back in court to try to get things done finally. Um, but through through the through the course of trying to get all of that done, the witness got threatened. Um, Tasha and 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 all the, the things she was doing, she she actually went to Tennessee for me. Let she, me interrupt you real quick. Forgive me, you were on a roll. You said in the um, midst of finding a new witness in your case that could vouch for your innocence that he was threatened. Who threatened him? Well, 
the the detectives that was on my case, uh, two Philadelphia detectives. One, uh, his name was Michael K. Hill, and the other one, I forget the other guy name, I believe his last name was Lynch or something like that. In the midst of um, trying to get the witness to come to Philadelphia, and he agreed to do that. But the day before he was coming to Philadelphia to come testify on my behalf, they sent the the detectives out there. They said an, an attempt to uh, make sure he came to Philadelphia, but you know which I never really understood because he was already set to come. I didn't see why it was necessary for them to go out there to make sure he came. Uh, hmm. But that was, that was the story that they gave. Now, uh, when you say East. they, who gave that story? The district attorney's office. Uh, wow, so you name. mean the assigned prosecutor in your case sent detectives out to basically threaten a witness that was prepared to come forward to testify about your innocence? Yes, yes, and um, wow, and then uh, it took like so so long, like we had to go through so many procedures to even get him. It took another four years to actually, like, to actually get him in court. Uh, he testified, and then uh, the judge retired. Then I had to do it all over again, and in the midst of all of that, um, the United States Supreme Court. Wanda ruling um, that my sentence was unconstitutional because I was a juvenile. And um, I think my innocent claims at that point took sort of like a a, ba a bad seat to the courts. And they wanted me to get resentenced. And they wanted me to go through that process before they dealt with anything further. And um, unbeknownst to everybody at the time, uh, when I went for resentencing, because of my record and all the things I was doing in prison, my case wound up being the first case where the uh, district attorneys in Philadelphia decided to just, um, whatever numbers or whatever time I had in at the time, they just settled it right there and just, they just let me out. So within a few months, I was, able, I was, I was released from my resentencing in uh, 2017. I came home on September the 20th. I mean, excuse me, September the 4th of 2017. Um, but I mean, you know, uh, Tasha was there to greet me when I came out of prison. Uh, and, and I have to tell you that you know, when, I, when I came home and I gained this new perspective in life and I was able to look back and all the things that she did in terms of advocating for me, um, I began to appreciate it just even more because I realized how much difficult it was. You don't always get a chance to see that when you're in prison. Um, the difficulty that exists in terms of helping somebody to prove they're innocent because, you know, the Commonwealth is a machine. We all know that. And, um, you know, she stayed in my corner and by my side for, for 15 years helping me. And, that, and that's an amazing commitment for somebody to uh, dedicate their time, their energy, their financial resources to help somebody in that nature to try to restore some type of normalcy and they're getting their life back. Um, she was more than a friend. She was more than an advocate. And, and I believe that uh, because of her experience, um, and this all this was done prior to uh, the, the, the law degree, prior to her taking up office in the district attorney's office, prior to working with any judges. All this was long before that. And she was she was advocating at a very, very young age. Um, and, it's, and it's really amazing to see that she's able, she's, she's, she has been able to um, to continue on and, and go to greater heights. And, and I'm, I'm really proud of the work that she's doing, all the things that she's doing. And I believe that she's more than fit to be a judge because I don't think you would get any fairer than what she can bring to that bench. I really appreciate that, G, so much. Um, well, Scarfo, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. But uh, I, you know, this was a good conversation with all oh, the guys. Oh yeah, oh yeah, we gonna sprucing it up because right now we're gonna talk a little bit about some music. All right, while you're there right now, just give me like the top two um, R and B and top two uh, male and female R and B that you listen to currently. It's your greatest of all times. You on the podium right now, so you might as well go ahead and be first. Who are you yeah, talking, to? talking to? Me? Yeah, I'm talking to G. 
<laughs> you, I didn't move you. Yeah, yeah, it's on you right now. Uh, I mean, I'm real old school, though. I, I listen to a lot of it. It don't matter. Though. It don't matter. It, it really doesn't matter. That's what makes music. It doesn't matter what era. Right now, who's your top two male and female? Um, it could be rap. It don't matter. Rap, R and B. It doesn't matter because we, we got a couple R&B. more people, and I'm quite sure they're thinking right now. I, I like I like I like Usher. I like Usher. I listen to Usher and um the Weekend. I like the Weekend. Okay, um, the Weekend. Yeah, I like I like his music. Was, um, I think he's really creative in terms of the the female artists. Um. I would ha- I would have to you know like I said I I'm, I listen to a lot of old music I, I like Mar- Mary J Blige. I oh know Mary J, stuff. you got it. take me as I am yeah definitely. I, I know this, a lot of her music spoke to me when I was in prison. Uh, a lot of a lot of music that I still listen to is a lot of music that helped me get through the times. That you I was know what? In. I'm glad you said that because if you take it back to her first album, what's the four one one? Um, you remind me and all of those big hits when she first came out. Those songs have still they still have the impact if you listen to it in a big system at any given time. She's a great lyricist, great artist. All right, let's switch to the men right now. Uh in terms of the, uh rap or men, um it doesn't matter. Just give me two. I'm gonna just make everybody just do two and two and that way, you know, we oh, just well, keep I, moving I said, and then Tosh will come right said, back. In terms of in terms of R and B, I like I like Usher and I like The Weeknd. Um, that's what I've been that's listening to. I, mean, I, I listen to a lot of artists. I'm, I'm like real broad musically. I listen to a lot of stuff, but a lot of stuff that I listen to now is essentially like the music that that helped me get through when I was in prison. I, you know, so. you, you, that's why I I bring it back to music. Because sometimes there's a song that even when your troubles was there, that other song was there that brought you back, that lift you up. You know, there was always songs out there that um, that you remember that brought oh, brought you back to, oh, OK, I feel like a kid again. I feel good again. Um you know that type of music. That's what music does. Music mm. transcends, and it actually tells your journey. You know, as you go. You know, um, you said Mary J. Blige, four one one album, incredible. But she did a lot of other music after that. But that four one one had some hits on it. Absolutely. I remember a song that really used to inspire me was um, Optimistic. Um, I forget who's singing, but you know what I'm I know talking, what you're about. talking about. Optimistic. It was a song out. I, I know which one you're talking about. Yeah, that was really inspirational to me. I really liked that song. I used to always listen to it. And I listen to it a lot now. Yeah, optimistic. Yeah, and it, it has a message in it. Yeah, optimistic, absolutely. you know. All right. So that's your that's your two and two. Um okay, Jeff, you're on the clock. Two and two. I don't know if you listen to rap. But you might do, but um, if not, it could be pop music, it could be whatever country, whatever you want. You might shock us and, and go all rap. I don't know, but you want to clock right now. Oh, Jeff, you're muted. Wait a minute. I'll okay, here we that. go. There you go. Okay, yeah. So, uh, like, like, like uh, Giovanni, I'm I'm eclectic. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go on on the male side. I'm I'm going to go with. Uh, with the group Nickelback, I love their song. If today was your last day, I find that to be really inspirational. And uh, and the second male group, there was a well, was a song. It was by um, I was by uh, Ti and uh, Justin Timberlake. That, oh, uh, Timberlake. That song, uh, dead and gone, dead and gone. Oh, yeah, we was talking goodness. about the natural evolution and leaving behind the the old ways and be more enlightened, more 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 mature. Uh, on the on the female side, uh, I really. Uh, I really like that song "Friends" by Jody Watley. Jody Watley, yeah, that's yeah, a classic. that song "Friends," yeah. So I really like, I really liked uh, that. I really liked that song uh, by her. And okay. I did. And uh, last one is uh, I like I like Paula Abdul. You know that that song uh, "Straight Up." 
you oh, know yeah. so so oh, the commonality oh, okay. just realness just realness with people interaction on on whatever level and whatever relationship paradigm it is you know even just you in the world just just being real with people so yeah. that speak that speaks to me paul abdul definitely a legend um great dancer uh choreographer um between her and j lo they're going to give you a great show that 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 brings it back to lisa lisa colt jam i wonder if i take you home that kind of music so definitely uh that was the 80s era i believe you you went to with uh um, yes, paul that's Abdul, right. and um that means janet jackson was around yes uh, you know so oh yeah it's all right that's one of the bangers that janet did do all right so it sounds like uh, you did. Was that two or you got two? More that was two you? and two. That was two and two. I could do a couple. Two, I could do a couple more. But yeah, I did two and more because Lorenzo, he's having a cyber attack down there, as you can see. Um, so we're gonna let we're gonna let you talk a little bit more about some more uh, artists. Sure. So I I did like that song by uh, Nas, uh, "My Country." Nas, oh, you going in today? <laughs> <laughs> So I like that one, and here's another one I really think that you'll uh, that, that you'll appreciate my liking, uh, is uh, uh, that song uh, by uh, Wiz Khalifa uh, when he teamed up with Charlie Puth for that song T uh, "Till I uh, Till I See You Again," which was the oh, theme song okay. at the end of yeah. Fast and Furious Part Seven after you know Paul Walker had passed away. They made the video on it, and uh, you know, songs talking about people that are traveling down the same road of life. And then they're watching, you know, Paul walk another person driving a car, and then they like go and finally the roads veer off. And I saw that as, you know, metaphorical, like all right, the life path, you know, it, it, it veers because you know his obviously became over, but the other other person, other brother in the car had to keep going with his life. It wasn't his time to get off the road yet. Yeah, and see, one thing about both of y'all, what I what I noticed was, whatever those songs y'all pick, it has something to do with your journey. Yes, um, yes. The adversity that both of y'all went through. Uh, when you said Mary J. Blige G, well, one thing about her music, it's heartfelt and it's real. And that's one of the biggest things about her career. To me, she had the most hits in realness when it came down to music. And that's why to, to, to this day, when she does her um her live, her live performances, she's always giving you a great show. But it's those songs that tell the journey. And that's mm. what make Mary J. Blige Mary J. to me. Yeah, she was really passionate. passionate yeah. Okay, wait a minute. He's back after a cyber attack. He's there. Mm -hmm. Lorenzo, <laughs> you made it back. You What's made up? it. You, you back again. You like Rocky. You back again. So... Uh, no we, need, we need two and two. We need two hip hop, two R and B, two female R and B. It doesn't matter. Just two and two. Two of your greatest of all times. It's pretty much going to tell us your journey. Believe it or not, whatever songs you pick. Dmx. Uh oh, uh, you had to put the dog <laughs> in there. The dog. Okay. Yeah. Rest in peace, Dmx. Dmx. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, I like Alicia Keys. Lisa Keys. Oh, you know what? Lisa Keys did that song. Kanye West produced it. You don't know my name. That's one of the best songs on the radio. Yeah, you know, it's Jay Z. You know, you got, uh, mm -hmm. I listen. I listen to a whole bunch of different music, and the reason why I listen to a bunch of different music because. At the various prisons I was at, you couldn't get certain channels, so you had to make do or whatever that the radio station could pick up. So I listen to a lot of different genres, but uh, I like, you know, Mary, you can't go wrong, you know, and DMX, you know. DMX, Mary J. Blige, you will not go wrong with neither one of them. Um, I always tell people, I think DMX was the greatest electrifying rapper live because the way he did it on tape is the way he was and you know he was growling and and he did all that dog sound and he really did that when he was in his heyday big shout out and by the way 
You got to give a big shout out to Jay Z and Beyonce. They bought his catalog and gave it to uh, DMX's 17 kids. He put up $10 million, bought the catalog, and gave it to his kids so they could have something. Shout out to Jay Z and Beyonce. That was accurate. I thought I heard that that might not be correct. That's oh, they not got it. Oh, they not. Oh, yeah. Lord. They put $10 on them now. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh oh. That's well, not- that's what they said, though. They said that. Yeah. All no, right. it was a rumor, you know, there's so many different rumors, you know, going out. It's hard to, you know, differentiate what's the truth and what's not the truth. But in times like that, not saying that Jay Z need any clout or fame because he got it all, you know, but a lot of times. Your name gets tied to things that's not the truth. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. Now, this is the truth. Jay-Z sold Spotify for 350-something million, and he only put up like 20 million. Now, that is yeah. <laughs> that huh? is real. All Ooh, right. So, the title. Yeah. Tasha, you're back on the clock. It's oh. time for you to finish it off or uh, tell them, you know, some more questions they if you want to um, throw them at them. Well, um, I don't know. I think we covered a lot of ground. Um, you know, one of the reasons why I was hoping we could pull this off today, and we did. And again, shout out to SL Digital Media Podcast for just helping to bring the message to the community. Because I don't think people understand um, how oftentimes people are wrongly convicted. And the guys can speak to why wrongful convictions happen. Um, now, their cases happen, um, let me see, well, Giovanni was 91. I think Kat was, ni- Lorenzo was 96 or 95. And Jeff, Jeff, when did your case happen? Yeah, my case yeah, happened in 1990, and I was not exonerated until 2006. 1990. So, these cases happen during times when we didn't have the technology we have today. Um, DNA has come a long way. Uh, police interrogations were not recorded. We didn't have body worn cameras. Um, we didn't have dash cams uh, mounted in police cruisers. Um, of course, so Giovanni's case is out of Philadelphia. You know, that was under the regime of Lynn Abraham. So things were just very different. Um, Lorenzo's case was right here in Dauphin County. Um, Jeff was out of New York, of course. And so their cases took place when times were a bit different. So I do think we've come a, a, a ways in terms of technology. But at the end of the day, you can't change um, people. Um, you can only hope that you can change what's in their heart. And the people I'm referring to are the people who are in charge and in control of what happens in our lives. And that would be law enforcement, that would be the police, that would be prosecutors. Um, And it's important that we all play our part in our local elections because we determine who serves as our elected district attorney. Um, We have a say so in Uh, the people who are uh, put into positions of power. And in Pennsylvania, our upcoming May 18th primary is super important because each level of judicial authority will be on the ballot. So our minor courts are out here. We call them magisterial district justices. So our um, magisterial district justices uh, will be on the ballot. The Court of Common Pleas, which is the race that I am running in, And then we have our two uh, intermediate appellate courts, uh, which are the Superior Superior Court of Pennsylvania and the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania. And shout out to Judge uh, Sierra Thomas Street. She commented earlier. I'm not sure if she said Oh, yeah, tomorrow. (laughs) Dick Gregory's son is coming. Lisby is coming. It's going to be crazy again tomorrow. Stay tuned. Yeah, that's going to be hot. And she was um, present today for the broadcast. I noted where she had commented. We've been hanging out on the campaign trail. That's been awesome. She's currently a common pleas court judge in Philly, um, but she is running for a seat, uh, one of the two open seats on our Commonwealth Court. 
Um, and then, of course, our Supreme Court, there is one seat open there. So this is a super important time for Pennsylvanians. And I just hope that people go out to vote. Um, as I've said in the past, uh, my race is a historic race. In 235 plus years, there has never been a Black woman to serve on the Dauphin County Court of Common Pleas. And so we can all change that on May the 18th, hopefully on May the 18th for good. But if not on May the 18th, that's the first step. And then the second step is on November the 2nd. Um, I'll go ahead and close out. But I want the fellas to um, end with any last words that they have. And then I'll give like my final, because um, I do want the viewers to know about a very important event that we're having tomorrow. Um, so guys, do y'all want to close it out? I just want to stress the importance of people showing up to vote. You know, uh, if people don't vote, then whoever we get in office for in any election, you know, uh, you know, we if we don't vote, then you know we get what we deserve. You know, it's really important who's in office. You know, do we want to have someone that's going to be a rubber stamp? Do we want to be somebody that you know is really going to be objective? That's going to be neutral. That's going to apply the law and the facts. You know, evenly and fairly. You know, uh, one of the main reasons why it takes so long to correct wrongful convictions. You know, which the average length of wrongful imprisonment is fourteen years is that too many times judges just rubber rubber stamp deny appeals and they rubber stamp deny motions. And when you read the case summaries of people who've been exonerated, there were plenty of red flags along the way that, you know, when and judges could have stepped in and, and did the right thing, but didn't. And, and uh, so, you know, I think that who's in any position is super important. And it's really, really important to, you know, get, justice oriented you know judges in office so i do encourage everybody to you know show up on uh election day and encourage all call or encourage all your friends and family associates to come out and vote so i'm really rooting hard for you here uh, uh latasha so i'm hoping that uh, you in fact get elected thank you Jeff. who's next <laughs> Everybody that's looking and viewers, you know, this is the time to come forth to make a difference. A lot of people see rallies and all that type of stuff and work wonder why people stay in prison so long for wrongful convictions. This is the time to step up to put a judge in play that, you know, would attack this from day one and not 14, 15 years later. You know, this is the time, you know, you know, understand a lot of people run on the balance being tough on crime. I have no problem with that. I have a problem when there's innocent people in prison that doesn't belong there and their case get rubber stamped to the next to the next court, to the next court. And like Jeff said, that's why the average innocent person who's fortunate to get out spends at least 14 years in prison. We're trying to break that cycle and at the end of the day, put a good person in there. And her, Natasha Wreck can speak for us, speak for herself. Like it's unblemished. Like, you know, she's the truth. She needs to be in there. And our system will never change if you don't put the pieces in play to make that happen. And, you know, the vote goes to Latasha in my case. All right. We got one more. Well, I certainly uh, echo the sentiments of both Lorenzo and Jeff. Uh, one of the things that um, I could definitely say is that um, Latasha is someone who definitely deserves to be put on the bench. Uh, I think she'll uh, make the playing ground a little bit more fair. Um, one of the things I've done in that regard was I reached out to a lot of people that I knew in Harrisburg. And so I'm going to take this opportunity um, to, to, to tell everybody that I know that's in the district that she's running in Dolphin County to, to, to definitely make sure you go out and vote. We need their people on these benches. Um, like you see, one of the things that's happened in Philadelphia, you have um, the DA's election that's coming on, Larry Krasner, and uh, I believe he's running against uh, uh, Carlos Vega. And we, I mean, from my perspective, having Carlos Vega back into office, especially in the top office, is like going back to the Lynn Abraham days. So that's something that can't happen. Um, we need to put people on the bench. That's going to be fair. That's going to be progressive and have a 
have a mindset that's a war of justice, and I believe everything I know about Tasha that she can provide that. You know what I'm saying? Not just, you know, again, like, like Renzo said, her, her reputation and her history for advocating for the innocent is already well established. We just need to get her in here so she can take that same advocacy to, to another level. So again, everybody that I know and everybody I don't know, you in that area, vote no time. <laughs> All right. That's Aww. it, people. That's it. Another fireside chat with Latasha Shereen William ESQ, uh, Bill County Assistant District Attorney. She's running for the Dolphin County Common Pleas Court Judge candidacy. Make sure you vote for Latasha Shereen Williams. We are signing off. Thanks, fellas. Thanks, Don't stop. Keep going. Absolutely. Thank you.